So, like I said, we're going over advanced JavaScript. Uh, last or two weeks ago was uh, Spaces, our current webmaster, uh, basic JavaScript. So I'm just going to recap some of the basics, and then I'm going to m move on, on to more advanced stuff. So my name is Voy. I'm the current admin. I, uh, I, was, I was the webmaster last year, and I was also doing a talk on JavaScript. So I have some experience. Uh, if you want to, that's, that's my GitHub page. I <coughs> don't think anyone will actually go onto it. But so JavaScript, nothing to do with Java, for you probably already know. It's used for um, mostly web programming and browsers and also for servers. And yeah. So the plan for today is revision of basics, uh, covering objects, classes, prototypes, um, async, so basically stuff that people didn't understand the last time, as well as doing nice things with Java, JavaScript, sorry. And uh, then there will be pizza. So revision. So if you want to open up uh, the dev console in your browsers, um, it will greatly help you if you're on Chrome, if you press F12. If you're on Firefox, it's Shift Control Q. Yeah. Uh, and that will allow you to write in ja uh, JavaScript directly inside your web browser. So if you just want to make a file for testing, uh, you can make a new file, call it main JavaScript, main.js, that's the extension for JavaScript files. Uh, and basically all code that you work in would be saved from there, so you can basically reload your web page to uh, get the page working, uh, to get your code working. And if you also create an HTML template uh, with this inside it, so basically, uh, open up HTML, close HTML inside the head, put in the link to the main JS, which is the JavaScript file, and also make sure to close the script, otherwise it won't work. So let's revise hello world program. So basically here we're de declaring a variable called hello. And it's a string with a value of hello world. Next, we're creating a function called uh, print whatever, and you pass in something as an argument. And then, basically, what it does, it console logs uh, what you put in. So basically, console log is sort of like the default, the output of uh, JavaScript when you don't want to actually do anything with the DOM or edit the page itself. You can just basically print it to console log. So you can see what you're doing. And then uh, at the bottom, we're basically calling print or whatever, and we're passing in hello, so the string at the top, into the function. So the basic uh, data types in uh, JavaScript are numbers. There's no really distinction between uh, integers, floats, or doubles. It's basically number. So it can be negative, it can be zero, it can be one, it can be decimal places, it can be with uh, exponent at the end. Yeah. Um, yeah, so basically now moving on to functions. There's different ways of declaring functions. You can do function my, uh, my function here, and that basically takes no arguments and does absolutely nothing. Uh, then you have function my func, which returns true. So basically, again, no parameters, but it returns something. And then you can pass in uh, parameters, and it can do something with them and return whatever it is. And also, you can declare a variable, which is an anonymous function. So that way, you can basically call f as a normal function. So whenever, uh, let's say the uh, f did something, the anonymous function, basically what you will do is f, and then in brackets, you'll put in what you want to actually have it do. And then at the bottom we have uh, a 
anonymous function in the, in the closure. So basically, they're kind of like a self-calling function. It's, it's they're sometimes uh, useful, but you wouldn't really use them that much unless you're going into really advanced stuff. So basically, what it does, it creates an anonymous function uh, which logs stuff, and then at the end we have. Uh, empty brackets, which basically symbolize that it's calling itself. So that's just a picture. Uh, so now let's move on to uh, the actual kind of heart of today's talk, which is uh, classes, objects, and prototypes. So let's begin with objects. So the basic properties of objects are they're instance of something. So even when you're creating an empty object, it's an instance of an object, if that makes sense. And objects can contain methods, they can contain variables, but there's no really private, uh, private variables. Everything is public inside the, inside the object. And really, in JavaScript, everything is an object. Uh, they're all kind of derivatives of object uh, base. They're kind of extending function in a way. So basically, you can have an empty object, which is basically two uh, curly brackets. And you c the objects are usually, uh, well, not usually, they're always key value stores. So you can see that you have hello word. So the way that you declare it, basically hello, that without, will be without quotations, that will be the key, and then the value will be word that's with quotation because it's a string. And then you can have uh, multiple, the objects that store multiple data types, so you can store an empty object called thing, so again, key, and the value is an empty object, and then multiple, which is an array, so it's storing an array of one, two, three, three numbers. And you can also have multiple keys and values inside one object. So here we have uh, a string, and we also have an array inside an array of strings inside one object. So you may be wondering why is everything an object? Uh, well, consider this case when you have an array, and you can basically call a method on the array called push. I know it kind of sounds similar to other languages, but to be honest, I couldn't find any special cases, but that's basically the way it is. You can treat everything as an object in JavaScript. You don't exactly need to know that, just it's a fun fact. Okay, so the way that you can use an object is you can declare it. So here we have uh, var data, and we're starting uh, code, which is 200. So code is a key, 200 is the value, and it's a number. And message OK, so message key OK value. So we can basically log it. So if we do console log uh, data code, that will basically take the data object and get the code member of it and print 200. And you can also set it, set afterwards, after it's created, you can also set uh, the value of it. So here we're changing data message from OK to not OK. And we're, uh, again, once we console log the data, you'll see that you have an object and then basically what you change. So if you want to, you can try it out in your browsers, creating an object like this in a file and see what it actually gives you. And it should be exactly this. <laughs> yeah, so if you want to try it, maybe. Okay, so hopefully that should have worked. If anyone does, anyone have problems with this, or everything worked fine? No. Okay. So now we'll move on to classes. Uh, well, they don't exactly exist in JavaScript. It's sort of like, oh, we'll just call it a class, but it's not really a class. So basically, what you create is you can do a function car, which will act as a class. So you can specify this make equals make. So basically, you can create a car, and that will be the make of the car. So uh, basically, this make will be kind of the member of the car class. 
So then what you can do is you can create an instance of it, so here Tesla, so a new car, uh, and then Tesla as the parameter for the make. So then we can do, uh, we can console log the Tesla. So if you actually do it, you will see that you get, instead of objects like the last time, because you just declared it, now you actually see you have car, because that's actually what's, what was being uh, the actual type of the object. So do you want to try that? Do you get Maybe. <laughs> so, so basically, when you, you can access the members of initialize of the instance by doing test log and then using a dot notation to get the, the make. So I said that they don't really exist yet with uh, asterisk. So what it means is basically uh, there's a new standard uh, coming uh, for classes which will actually implement a proper class structure thingy. So you have class car and then you have the constructor which will act the same way as before it was function car. This will, will actually make it much easier to use. Again, you may be thinking like it's adding extra lines of code over function car but if you think about it, it makes more sense to do it this, this way, even if it's longer. And it's way easier to actually read the code and organize it afterwards. So it will be coming to browsers near you. Uh, no one really knows when. And if you want to go onto that website, you will see the entire uh, list of browsers and server kind of site uh, JavaScript implementations. And that will show you what is actually implemented of the, the new standard. And if you actually go onto it, you'll see it's, it's not really much. There's stuff working in Firefox, stuff working in Chrome, but in general, stuff is not very there yet. So you may be thinking, let's do classes, but I'm going to show you this is a naive way of doing it. So let's you I'm taking the same kind of class I did before, so function car, make, but this time I'm adding a function. Uh, I'm, I'm adding a method to the class, and it's this drive and then anonymous function, console log, so I drive whatever you specify. You may be thinking, well, what's wrong with it? Well, I'm going to explain in a second. Basically, it will work, no problem. It will work as normal, nothing. You'll maybe not even notice that you did something wrong. But basically what you should do is you should prototype. So this is the proper way of doing uh, JavaScript classes and even the new implementation of class is not actually doing something completely different. It's basically abstracting this which is basically create a new function car, and then what you do is you specify car.prototype drive. So that basically creates a, kind of like a prototype of a drive, so it knows that when you do car.drives, it's supposed to execute that function, yes. but instead of actually creating the <coughs> entire function itself, it's making it much more memory efficient and way faster as well. So, but really the working is exactly the same, just that you have to, instead of doing car and like inside, you do this.drive, you do uh, car.prototype.drive. A little bit more code, but same functionality and it's way faster, easier, well not really easier, but that's, that's the proper way of doing it. And it works the same way. Um, another thing to note is that when you assign, uh, when you create a new variable and you assign it an already existing object, it will pass by reference, meaning you'll modify the original uh, object kind of with a new name. So here, if I do uh, just uh, Zoe equals Tesla and I do Zoe dot uh, drive, you'll still see that the output will still be I drive a Tesla, although you basically created uh, something new, Zoe. So basically you can set it again to make sure it's fixed. Um, when you set it again, will that copy the original object or is it still editing the, the old object? Uh, it it actually object? still is editing the old object because it's passed by reference. So you're editing the original data. So better idea would be either 
when you assign it, you can delete it. So delete Tesla with uh, delete being, the Tesla would be the, the argument for delete. Or you can basically create a new Zoe class uh, instance, sorry. So now let's move on to the hard stuff that people didn't get the last time. And I understand why, because it's not the easiest thing to gra grasp the concept of at the beginning. But when you actually understand the way it works and its uses, you realize how cool it is in JavaScript and really in all other languages which actually implement async. So basically, what is async? Well, what it does, it doesn't block. It continues on with the task and it revisits the task when it's done. So what it means is, I'm going to explain it in a while. Blocking basically means that when you start doing something, it, you can't do anything else while you're doing it. So async basically, once you say that you want to do something, the code will be registered, okay, I'm doing that in the background kind of. And when the data is done, then I'm going to revisit it and do whatever is supposed to be done after the task is actually completed. So the advantages of it, it's not blocking, it's concurrent, uh, but the disadvantages are, it's hard to understand, it has limited scope, I'm going to explain that, and you have loads of nested functions, and again, I'm going to explain that. You may be thinking, well, that's much more, well, one more disadvantage than advantage, so why really bother with it? Well, because these two points are much more important than these three disadvantages. So why would you use async? Well, you can consider this code, PHP, I know it's PHP code, don't judge me, I sometimes write it. Uh, so basically, uh, you get stuff from, uh, well, get a request, um, and then basically you send the data to a database. It may be taking a long while because it's over a network, you're querying a database which may be in another country, it's going through proxies, it has to be replicated, so before you get the result, it's one minute of your life gone, or well, one second. For, for humans, it's not that much. For computers, that's eternity. So once it's done, it's basically printing out DOM and then saying hi. Hi, let's say, is something, another function that you want to run. So uh, another function or continuing on with the code. So that's basically the indication of it. So basically what you're doing is you're starting and then the client just waits because there's no data. The client is doing work and there's nothing happening at all. And the server is also doing stuff and other requests are, are kind of blocked but, but by what's already happening. So if we look at the JavaScript example of it, you'll see that again, kind of that pseudo code for Java, JavaScript, which, but it still works. So we can get the data from request get data. Uh, that's not really existent, I'm just making it up. And then you're sending the data to the database, but instead of sending it, you're sending it as a parameter, just like you did with PHP, but also you're passing in anonymous function. So basically what it does, it's, it's a callback. So like I said, it's uh, going back to the task that you specified, that's exactly what's happening. So once you go, you send the data to the database, it's doing something in the background, it's merging all the data, but you're not actually stopping there, you're continuing on with the code. So you can continue on with the code that's here, in this example it's high, and basically once the data is back from the server, then it's going to execute that anonymous function, and then <coughs> it's going to send the data to be true. So another example is this time with jQuery, which is a front-end kind of helper library slash framework. So let's give an example. So you get a var submit. So let's say you have a form and you want to uh, send the data on of the form once you click enter or the button. In this case, the button is when you click it. So basically it's getting a, an element with ID of submit. And basically, it creates then an async kind of, uh, what do you call it, task, I, I would say. 
so basically once you click on submit, it will post the data and it will uh, change the value of the status box. So, but basically, while you don't want to block, so basically once you declare it, you don't want the whole website to just stop because you're waiting for someone to click. You still want to scroll, you still want to see animations or windows popping up, wherever it is, and you kind of changing values inside the text box to making sure that you may have some kind of evaluation, is stuff correct, so is the password of correct length or something. So basically you don't want it to stop, so you, if you do it async, uh, basically what it means, it creates kind of a handle, it just leaves it to the background whenever you're done or do click, it's kind of getting back the code, doing all the stuff, and then returning it. So here, for example, we're uh, updating timebox, so it will basically uh, continue on with the working of, it will register that as a kind of event to come back to, but then you're uh, updating the time box, so that maybe, I don't know, you may have time on your website. So basically that will continue to run without waiting for that to finish. And again, in here you can see that we have another request nested, so once you click on it, what you want to do is you actually want to get the form data, so the user request to the database, and once the database, and once the server responds, you see you have an uh, anonymous function, but this time with a parameter status. So basically that status then, once it receives the thing from the server, it will go into the status box. So basically you're, once you click, it's not instantly going to the server, it's, you still have to wait for the server to respond. And that's what I was talking about with nesting. So as you can see here, we only have kind of two layers of nesting. You have this async call, then you have this async call inside it, and then you have to finally do something. It's not really that bad, but sometimes you can get into loads and loads of nested kind of callbacks, which can get a little bit messy. One easy solution to it is basically instead of passing in a function, anonymous function, you can say that uh, you can create a new uh, function called update status box. So here you do post from data and then you do update status box and you pass it in the status. So basically once it's done that, it will post the thing, it will send the status as a parameter to the uh, post uh, change uh, status box or whatever I said. So basically that's uh, async example two. So when you want to write async call, let's say uh, you want to calculate a sum of something big. Like this is a case of you're calculating a sum of two to the power of 51. So you're calculating one plus two plus three plus four, all the way to two to the power of 51. That's a massive number. Uh, so basically you don't exactly want it to be blocking your entire page. This, this may be not taking that long, but <coughs> There may, you may be doing functions which will take much, much longer. So basically in this case, it's instead of doing at the end return a total, and that will return a value, you basically create a callback. So what you do is you pass an n, which is the number that you want to sum up to, and then you pass in a callback parameter. And the callback can be a function, so in this case it is. Well, yeah, that's how all callback would work. It actually is a function, yeah. So uh, you calculate the total, and then you basically do callback and total. So when you're done with that, you're basically uh, calling the function again, the callback function, which is passed here. And once it's done it, with the result, which is the total, it will then print it. I know it's sort of like, you may be wondering like which way does it go, because it's not very clear. Think about it this way. What you're theoretically doing is you have just sum of and then uh, map the power and basically this this code imagine it's actually sent in as callback inside the function so once it's done here can you you can just imagine that the, this function which actually be right here which will print it so you can kind of imagine us passing in the entire function in, into the callback so it can be executed inside the function itself it's, it's a little bit hard to understand, but when you kind of think about it and anal analyze what the code does, you'll realize that it's actually not that bad as it seems.
Yeah, and that's a, a JavaScript joke. Yeah. So now that you're done with the hard async, hopefully people understand it now. I know, I know you may not get it. It's, it, 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 it's okay. Because it took me ages to actually understand async. I was working on the app and that was querying a local database and that was responding in forms of callbacks. I was returning stuff that didn't work. I literally spent three weeks or something like that on it to actually realize, oh, so that's how callbacks work. And once I did, I realized the power of them and how much more useful they are over typical just do this, do this, do this, do that. You basically can go into another le level of complexity of your inside your program and you can add much more interesting stuff which will do stuff whenever it's ready so you can have servers continuously giving you information to the page so you can update stuff in real time and that's basically the really useful thing of async okay so time for some more fun stuff so now we're going to cover json which was already covered in the introduction to uh, JavaScript, but I'm going to just cover it again, just in case you missed it. Uh, we're going to go over errors, we're going to go over error caching, uh, typecasting, so basically changing from one type to another. We're going to go into writing JavaScript. I don't remember that. And then basically uh, the way that you can use JavaScript not only in browsers themselves. Okay, so JSON. JSON is a JavaScript object notation. So people just realize that the way that JavaScript objects are declared, it's actually not really that space wasteful when it comes to the length of it. Think about HTML. In order to do even a simple thing, you have to write HTML, head, title, and then you have to do body, and inside there you can finally do something. You're writing all these characters, you're writing the uh, less than symbol, more than symbol, you're writing all the unnecessary things just to pass in a simple information. And especially when you're duplicating stuff. So every single time you have a diff, you do diff, 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 diff. You're writing code, which is really unnecessary. So JSON kind of shows that you can do stuff much more compactly, yet you still have the same data uh, as you want because you can pass in ar uh, arrays, and uh, other JSON objects. So here you can see that we're declaring again the var data code 200 message OK. And what we're doing here is inside JavaScript, we're actually encrypting, well, we're changing the JavaScript object inside into uh, JSON. So when you do json.stringify in data, it will return you a string, which is actually the uh, JSON object. So if you just want to go and try doing it, just just take the script and run it yourself. So again, once we, we can console log it, uh, and then when you want to decrypt the string into J, uh, JavaScript object again, you can do json.parse, so you're parsing a string into a JavaScript object, and then it, when you call, so console log it again, you'll see it's the it should be the same thing as data at the beginning. Okay, so hopefully uh, we have written a bit of JSON now, or interpreted JSON and printed it out. So now let's go over and actually move on. Yeah. Oh no, no, no. What we can do is we can com now. I'll show you an example of combination of async and JSON at the same time. So uh, I was thinking where could I get an example, but then I realized I actually made one a, a while back. So uh, let me just quit out of it. So the URL shortener I made, that was in 2013, uh, actually uses async and JSON to query a server. Oh no, it may actually not use JSON. <coughs> it does, it does. Uh, but it's using async calls to the server um, to get 
shortened information uh, links. So let's say here we type in, uh, I don't know, red brick. You can see that now we shortened the link. So what you have just seen is an example of async. Usually when you click submit, it will send the data over, refresh the page, reload the page with the new data, and then you'll see what you've just sent, and is there an error or is there a su success? But this is actually using JSON. Uh, sorry, this is using async. So when we explore the source code for it, you will see that what you have inside uh, it's, forgive me for that code, it's a really bad code from ages ago. So basically it's, uh, it's getting the code. I can't remember what it does. Uh, <laughs> but basically then it's sending a post request to shorten.php and uh, what you pass in is the URL and the code. Oh yeah, code is basically authentication to make sure that you're running in the browser and you're not just making a uh, request from nowhere into the domain. That's what it does. So basically you can see that I'm posting data to the server and then basically with function, I'm getting the data back and then basically based on the data, I am figuring out what actually changed. So if the data is empty, then I'm changing the color of it to red. So if we actually do this, so if you have submit it, you actually see that it changed to red and it says, please enter a URL. So exactly what happened right here. If the URL is inv invalid, so if you just type buff, you see invalid URL. So that actually sent to the server, server responded, no, sorry, that's the invalid uh, URL that you put in. So it's going to give us back the inside data, it's invalid. And then we're here uh, again changing the page. And again, if we do already short, so if we do, uh, If we do bit.ly, which is already shortened, it's, oh yeah, sorry, that's invalid. You can see that the URL is already shortened, so there's no need to shorten it again. And with error, that's, errors, uh, I actually implemented it uh, sort of the wrong way, so there's errors when you have your input string, which is way too long. Uh, actually, probably without space. So let's just change the URL. Actually, no, it worked. <laughs> Never mind. Well, if it's, well, yeah, it will give you an error when the uh, thing is way too long. Define too long. Uh, I think over 56 characters. Also, why do you require HTTP? Uh, because it requires it to be a valid uh, URL. I could change it, but again, I, the last time I worked on it was in 2013. And then when uh, the default, so if it's not any of these, basically it means that the message has passed. So we basically change the value of it here. So let's say that shortened uh, uh, google.com. When we show it, we actually get a proper response back because that's the success message. I'm not really sure does it does. No, it doesn't print it. And then basically it automatically selects the input so you can copy the data. Yeah, so that's an example of uh, async calls on the website. You can see it, it basically like posted the data inside a post request with jQuery with all the information you needed, so input and code. 
And again, you can see an example of async here with the uh, document itself, where you were waiting for the document to load. That's kind of more uh, jQuery specific stuff. And then basically once you click on submit, uh, then it will execute uh, this, this code. Okay, so one of the things to notice is um, when you're creating a JSON, make sure you don't, uh, the object doesn't contain methods. I'm not really sure will it fail, I haven't, didn't have time to check it, but it, it will definitely not change it to a valid code because you can't truly really transmit a function which does something over JSON. And do you do that with JSONP? JSONP? Yeah. Uh, that's the, that's just jQuery specific spin, okay. I think, yeah. Jason P is, sorry? Uh, no, it's, it's basically jQuery has multiple requests. You can do uh, Ajax and basically specify everything yourself. You can do post, <coughs> you can do get, you can do, do uh, JSON P. Which I think JSONP, what it does, it's basically it parses JSON already and ignores uh, origin flags inside HTTP headers, which will allow it to query external domains from inside your code. I think that's what it does, yeah. But, oh yeah, so that's another thing to notice uh, when you're querying a server. Uh, for JSON, uh, when it's in, in HTTP, there's a thing called uh, remote access or some, some something like that. I can't remember the exact thing, but basically it means that you can't get data from other servers when the names don't match each other. So when I'm in, uh, let's say, have a website on on Redbrick and I'm trying to query an API of Yahoo, I can't actually do it because I don't have the, the browsers won't allow me to query external domains, so I need to use specific stuff to make sure it's actually allowed to, for me to query other domains. That, that's, I think that's what JSONP does. Okay. So now let's move on to errors. Um, errors are kind of dodgy in JavaScript because there's no really such a thing as errors you'll get in other languages. Because it's a runtime language, lots of stuff will actually just come out when you run it and you test it yourself, either with a testing framework or if you do it manually, mostly manually. Basically, uh, let's give an example. So you have var a, which contains one and two. But when you try to get the index, index of one million, it will actually fail. Well, no, it won't fail. In other languages, it will say out of bound, array out of bounds or index out of bounds. In this case, it will just give you undefined because it, it tried to look in A of, on the index 100, one, 1 million, but didn't find it, find it, so it just gave you undefined. So sometimes it may cause problems because you'll be expecting things to work, uh, you'll get undefined, it's not caught anywhere, and you realize that something should be working, and it's really hard to debug and actually find the root of the problem because you don't get a proper error message. I think there are tools which will actually test it and make sure that stuff doesn't accidentally get called like this, but again, it can still happen in, in JavaScript. So error catching. Um, let's say something gave you an error, so this is an example of bad JSON, and can anyone tell me why it's bad JSON? It's a, it's a reference to an object. Or no. Oh, there's no quotes from code. Yeah, that's it. So basically, JSON objects, all the key, the way that in uh, as a JavaScript object, it will just be basically code. 200, but since it's uh, 
JSON is there should be a quotations in front of the key as well. That's another thing to note when you're writing JSON itself. There has to be uh, quotations around the key itself. So key and value if it's a string. So here we're trying to parse uh, bad JSON. So data and JSON.parse bad. So basically what it do is will uh, show an error. So what you want to do is you can, you can do a try catch block. So try will try all the try the code out, and if it, there is an error, it will go into the catch block, and basically you can here uh, log the the error what happened. Uh, and now for error throwing, uh, that's that's just like an example text. It's not not really personal. Don't don't take it too far. Okay. So basically, uh, here we declare a variable called baby, and if the baby is not mine, then you trust. That, <laughs> that sounds very bad. But basically, you can uh, throw a custom type itself. So that's why that's how you can actually um, throw your arrows. <coughs> but it's fine with the baby because we then actually catch the baby. So it's all it's all nice and grand. We like to throw babies up and down. Babies like it. Yeah, so that's basically error drawing. Um, so you can make your own errors and catch them when you feel like it. Uh, yeah, so then you can also cast um, stuff. So let's say we have uh, raw is hello user 42. So we want to get uh, user 42, so the 42 bit. But if we just basically a split array on white spaces, which is the split, and then you specify uh, quotation marks inside it, so basically the delimiter, the limit, uh, that's basically splitting them on spaces. So you have an array of hello, user, and 42. But 42 is a st still a string because that's the original kind of data type that it was in. Uh, so if you just do id equals array2, and we, when you try to console log it, you'll see that it will log it inside quotation marks. Basically, it means that you are, it's, an, it's a string. So when you try, try to do 42 as a string plus 2, instead of getting 44, you may get 422, two, which is not really the desired behavior. So what you can do is actually you can parse it to a number. So if you do par id equals number, so capital N, and then uh, as an argument, you pass in uh, the thing that you want to par, the thing that you want to cast. And now when we try to console log the new ID, which is sort of the JavaScript, well, it's, it's, it's very popular because lots of people know JavaScript and you can basically write it quickly and easy on the server. It has huge capabilities. You can uh, have your own C++ modules <coughs> imported into it, so you can still do pretty fast stuff with it. And, uh, and NPM, which is a node package manager, which allows you to import packages that people already made, and there's absolutely loads of them. I can't exactly tell you the number, but I think it's over. Or something. No yeah, it's sort of the same, it's the mentality of there's an app for that, there's a package for that. It's the same thing really for Node. So that's for the servers that you want to do, but really you can do the entire ecosystem you, all of your products, you can do them with JavaScript. So you can have JavaScript on the server, JavaScript on the browser, then you can make an app uh, with JavaScript, with PhoneGap. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. That's when I was working with the app and I was trying to learn async. It's, it's not the best, but if you really, really want to make an app and not use Java, it's, it's an option. And uh, you can control, control drones with it. So there's a website called uh, notecopter.com that you can program. Uh, I think it's using the Parrot 2 drone. I can't remember. But you can actually program the, uh, the drone itself to actually, the quadcopter, to do uh, stuff with nodes. So you can add in sensors. You can control it. So basically, you can do flips. It can go forward, backwards, wherever you specify it with nodes. And you can also create desktop applications with, uh, with JavaScript. So there's a tool called uh, nwjs.io, which basically stands for Node WebKit JavaScript. So uh, it's using Node.js, kind of packaged in, 
together with uh, WebKit, which is the rendering engine used in Chrome. So you theoretically have like a, your own version of Chrome running locally inside a package which is 60 megabytes big. So you can kind of have your own web browser application thingy. So you can really embed your website inside a standalone, um, standalone desktop application. And you can control headers with it, you can control the, the top box on the top, the uh, menus and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, so that's... Yeah, so once you're uh, very successful with the JavaScript, probably you'll see have this. It uh, doesn't always happen, but it, it, if, you're, if you try hard, it will, it will come to a good end. Yeah, and that, that's it, really it for the talk. I think if anyone has questions, you can put your hand up. With JavaScript, does uh, indentation really matter? Uh, it doesn't. It's not like Python where it will try to complain because you still have the uh, no, sorry, the curly bracket, so it knows what's embedded in, inside what. So. It's, it's not really that, it's actually, it doesn't matter at all because there's compression tools which will take your nicely formatted uh, JavaScript and actually just like combine it all together into one big single line of code. If you actually look at jQuery search, it's all compressed down to be just one line or two lines of code. It, it's not a short line of code, but it's, it's one line, so you don't actually need indentations nor spaces really at all in, in, the, in JavaScript. You need uh, semicolons. Yeah, you need semicolons, you need curly brackets, and normal brackets. Yeah, parentheses, yeah. Any other questions? <laughs>